Welcome to NucleCast, the official podcast of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Each week, we bring you leading experts for a lively discussion on topics related to strategic nuclear deterrence. Our host is Dr. Adam Lowther, Director of Strategic Programs at the National Strategic Research Institute. The views of the hosts and the guests are their own. Well, welcome back to NucleCast, and of course, I am your host, Adam Lowther, and today I have with me a very good friend, Dr. John Loudon, who is a professor of folklore at the University of Louisiana, and he is one of the... I, I worked with him. We spent uh, a few years together uh, with the Army working together, and he's really, really good at helping craft and tell stories. He's a folklorist. And so as you think about it, you, you might initially be saying to yourself, Adam, this is Nuclecast. We talk about weapons, strategy, Russia, China, nuclear energy. We talk about modernization programs. But I want to tell you, if you think back to uh, maybe that you haven't heard the episode yet, but if you Listen to the episode where we talk with David Craig, who is the editor of uh, Real Clear Defense, writing and explaining things to the American people is really important. And so for the nuclear community who has a message that I would submit to you is not all that well understood and it's not well explained so that the American people understand it and can can relate that and be related to it. Therefore, uh, I would say that the nuclear world doesn't have its message out there. So I thought, who better to come on NucleCast and help us as a community to understand how to craft a narrative and how to build our story and build our brand than John Loudon. So with that, welcome into NucleCast. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me today. I'm looking forward so, to our conversation. Yeah. Uh, well, we always have great conversations. It's uh, and and it's really, uh, it's really great to have you. And I'm I'm actually really interested to hear what you have to say because I've, you know, I've read a lot about narrative, and telling stories, and you know, trying, you know, I've, the business books where they talk to you about how do you build your brand and how do you build your story. And if you look at the corporate world. You know, they, they've sort of all gone to this, having this social purpose and they're trying to build relationships with customers. And that, that's sort of what the corporate world is doing. Go ahead, John. No, I would say, yeah. I mean, one of the things to, I think, to think about, especially for this community, which is very oriented towards science and, and, and precision, is that. Um, narrative is another way of thinking about causality, right? So for scientists and engineers and um, other people operating uh, within the nuclear realm, it's very important to think about, you know, if this, then that. We're dealing with causality, right? And so narrative in some ways is simply a, a very human localized form of thinking about causality. But it has a couple of, of added dimensions to it beyond that. But I mean, one reason why everybody wants to think about narrative is that we know the way narrative affects the brain and it affects it differently than arguments do or information does, which is why all those corporations are chasing narratives or trying to become storytellers. Because we know that narrative gets inside the brain and affects cognition in certain ways. And I think, you know, when we try and be, you and I, as, as scholars and scientists, try to approach things and make a rational argument, that's good. And it's an effective way of representing causality, but it doesn't quite get to people in the same way that narrative does. And I, you know, I think we want to do both, right? We want to be able to make arguments, but we also want to give people narrative so that we can pair those things together and really be more effective in our communication. So when you say that narrative affects the brain, it, it, it makes sense to me intuitively because well before we had written languages, we told stories. 
and traditions. And if, you know, for, for those who have a faith tradition, you know, those faith traditions often started uh, as, as stories that were passed down from generation to generation to generation. And eventually a language was created and then it was written down. And so I can see intuitively that, that that makes sense, but could you maybe explain a little for us how narrative, you know, what it does to people? It's really interesting. And we have an intuitive sense and we're going to be playing back and forth with this intuitive, you know, more deductive sense of things, I think during our entire conversation. Right. But one of the things that narrative does, and we're going to get more particular, I think, about narrative uh, as we go on. But one of the things that narrative does, we know this because we've done functional MRIs in which we put people into MRI machines and we ask them to read stories or listen to stories or even watch videos of stories. And one of the things that happens is, is that there's this thing called mirroring. So we have mirror neurons. And what happens is, is the same neurons that fire when you are running fire when you read a story and the protagonist runs. So if you if you find yourself um, either reading a book or maybe watching a movie uh, uh, and you find yourself mm, mm, right in the middle of a fight scene getting all tense, well, that's because uh-huh. your mirror neurons are firing. And you're, in fact, in your brain is playing out the same pieces as, as it would be as if you were actually fighting yourself. So that's what I mean by narrative has the capacity to reach into our brains. And I think one of the reasons why so many organizations, corporations, other kinds of entities are looking to get to that is that it reaches into our brain sometimes in ways that we aren't as consciously aware of as we might like to be so that they get deep into us. Right. So when you and I, uh, as as fathers, um, see a video in which, you know, a father and son or a father and daughter um, had this moment where, you know, he's been making all these little things for her and now she's going off to college and he makes her one more thing for her. That gets us, right? That hits us, strikes us deep because it's getting our mirror neurons to fire. Right. That makes sense. You know, but that's that is what narrative can do versus an argument or information. And so um, it, it might be good to sort of uh, open up the can that is narrative and try thinking about that a little bit more, because narratologists, that is people like me who, who study narratives, um, have sort of certain kinds of qualifications we want to say about narrative that that are a part of the way narratives do their business. And, and I think it would give um, people a sense of what someone like me means when I'm saying, when I'm talking about something being a narrative. And there's really just four elements to a narrative. And it's important to realize that none of these elements are sort of toggles. It's not either you have it or you don't. It's sort of gradients, right? So it's like sliders. And sometimes you have more of this or less of this. But the more you have of, of each, each of these elements, the more something is going to be a narrative. And I'm going to try and and use some examples. And and I should say I'm a folklorist, so I tend to work with really small text. That's kind of handy. Um, I don't think in terms of novels, um, but I also have some examples from films, and I hope that that helps people. Um, So the four things, just real quickly, um, are situatedness, event sequence, world making, and what it's like. And so let me just talk about those a little bit, right? Sure. So so situatedness is, is simply that the the text you have the the is is situated in a very particular time and place it's very it's it's specific um now situatedness also has to do with it being in a particular the telling of it is 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 situated as well but we're going to skip that for a second i just want to focus on text as themselves as opposed to any context in which they are they're deployed and so right you have a text and it's very specific it's memetic it represents the world and this is important, right? Because narratives spin up worlds. And I think it's important for everybody to realize that any representation is fictional. All Every time you make a narrative, every time you tell a story, um, just like any time you point a camera at something, right? When you point a camera um, at your family or you're on vacation, you're obviously trying to include some things in the shot and not other things. Same things with, with narratives. When you build a world in stories, you choose certain certain words, right? 
And that's that right. that helps to build the world. And what's I think surprising if you think about it is is how quickly we can spin up a world with fairly few words. I mean, we tell jokes all the time. And it doesn't take much, right? You could you could tell a joke in about a hundred words. And in the process, you'll have spun up a world that will exist out there in between you and I, or between me and anybody else I'm telling this, the joke to, and then it collapses as soon as it's done. That's an amazing ability. So you have this mimetic text, and then that text is representing a sequence of things, a sequence of events in that world, right? And this is where we're, we're connected to causality, because human beings are trying to figure out what causes what. Sure. But this is, so, so far, we're simply dealing with causality as well. But this is where the, the next two elements are the important things that make something more narrative. And first of that is sort of what people call world ordering, world making. I call it simply the world needs ordering, right? So we have a sequence of events, but they're in a very particular order. And, and they need to be ordered in a particular way. And in fact, one of the things we know about narrative, right, is that if you change the order, they have, you change the meaning. And then finally, we there's this thing that philosophers call qualia, and that's simply the sense of being there, of lived experience. And and this doesn't have to be mysterious. Um, think about it in terms of um, Aesop's fables, which often feature animals, or uh, maybe you read your kids the hungry cat, the angry caterpillar. It was, was the hungry caterpillar? Angry? I don't know. What one of those? Right. We we all the time we tell or the runaway dish. We tell stories uh -huh. that feature protagonists or characters who aren't human, but they have human-like elements. So that the last important thing, and this is really important for narrative, and this is, I think, where we get into how mirror, how the mirror neurons operate is, it makes us feel a part of the story. So it's qualia or the sense of being there or the sense of the audience feeling like they're there and they're part of it and they can see things from the character's point of view. I mean, one of the things I think that happens when we immerse ourselves in a in a good book is we're in the world and we're looking around. Well, that can only happen because of qualia. So those those four things combine, and when they're all sort of maxed out, you're really in the story, right? Right. You've got a great world. You're in that world. Um, things there's a series of things happening, and then those things are in a particular order, and and in fact. The order is actually helping your brain order things in the way that John Dewey talked about the ordering of experience. And then finally, you're there. So when you've maxed out all four of those elements, then you've got yourself a really good story. That makes and, sense. And, you know, I think it maybe it might be important to remind people that, right, stories kind of come in those two layers, right? There's the world represented. And then there's the words doing the representational work or other kinds of, of elements, right? If you're, you can tell a story, perhaps with pictures, I'm most people on the, on the fence about that, but you know, film can tell things in a certain sequence, right? There's the work, the work we do to represent something. And this is, this is important, I think, for people like you and I, cause we can, we can make very careful choices and we can fine tune our choices. And this is what we know, you know, happens in folklore and has been happening for, as you pointed out, thousands of years, right? A really good joke has been honed through hundreds, if not thousands of tellings. I mean, we now know that certain things are being done online algorithmically, but we've been doing that in some sense with the brain, the algorithms built into the human brain, fine tuning jokes, myths, legends, all kinds of stories are being tuned by passing through multiple humans on their path to the current moment where they still have to live or die based on how good they are. Yeah, that makes sense. So, I, you know, those words really fine tune things, but the, the, and, and the worlds that they represent change over time. But those two things are always present there. We have the words that are doing the representational work and we have the worlds that are represented. And it's important that the words keep, the whatever world is being represented is the one that we're interested in. Yeah. Now, you know, we're, we're actually about halfway through the show. So I want to take a quick break. You're listening to Nuclecast with professor John Loudon, and we're talking about narrative. And when we get back, John, 
I want to take this and this concept you've provided us and turn it to the nuclear community to help them craft their narrative. So stay with us and we'll be right back. This episode of NucleCast is brought to you by the Anwar Deterrence Center, whose mission is to educate Americans about the nuclear enterprise and strategic deterrence. Okay, we're we're back and we're talking with Professor John Loudon about narrative and storytelling. Now, you've you've laid out the four elements of narrative. Uh, was there any additional components that we needed to, to understand before we moved on? No, I mean that's the genius of this. I think is that it's yeah. it's very straightforward. Uh, you know, we know what makes for a good story. I think we all intuitively know it, and I think. All I've really done uh, talking with you is made sort of formalize certain those elements that we already kind of know in our gut of what works, right? We know we know that the, we build worlds and that all these worlds are are fictions, they're the human made things. And in the case of verbal texts, like the ones we create, either talking to each other or in writing, we choose the words. We have to choose them carefully, right? There's a difference between a girl throwing the ball, a girl flinging a ball or a grill, girl drilling a ball, right? Each of those mm -hmm. word choices gives us shades of intentionality and uh, some sense of, of, of the character's ability or competence to do something. And so those little choices change and, and flavor things, right? We have all these words that are associated with other things, you know, the, the flavor, the style. We're never really sure what they mean, but, the, but what they are is they're allowing us as, as storytellers, as narrators, to to affect the tale, right? So there's the telling, and then there's the tale. And I think when we, I think all of us could get better at, at at telling tales. Now, for for those of us that are on, you know, in the nuclear world, whether it's you know operators in the military, scientists in the labs, uh, folks in the corporate world who are developing delivery systems, we think in you know, I would say that the community is very sort of focused on science and facts. And so they, they tend to think that, well, our argument is superior and here's all the, the detailed data and they want to provide data. And then they, they expect, you know, everybody out there, the American people to, to look at the data, understand it. And then, uh, you know, agree with us that the, these are the right things to do because the data, you know, says this. Whereas I would submit that many in the disarmament community are less focused on the data and are more focused on ex giving, telling a story of harm. You know, if nuclear weapons are used, you know, here's the terrible things that are going to happen. And they tell, they tell this horrendous story and I would say that by and large, they're oftentimes more persuasive. And it's, it's really only because of bad actors like the Russians and Vladimir Putin, you know, threatening to use nuclear weapons that, you know, that, that they're less successful than they would have otherwise been. Cause I think they tell better stories. So for those, you know, those scientists, engineers, operators, who want to tell they they want to dispassionately sort of make an argument how do you tell them hey listen i know you you, you want to just lay out facts because you think the facts sort of carry your argument but but you have to you have to create a narrative and you have to tell a story that that not only speaks to the facts of it but speaks to the other element of of you know humanity and human nature 
So what, what advice would you give folks that are scientists and officers and who, who are not naturally disposed to relying on narrative and story to try to make a point and, and carry a position? That's a tough one. I think the first thing I would say is uh, not only are you not alone in that effort, but your effort is a long standing one. As a folklorist, I'm someone who studies legends and legends have been around for a long time. And one of the things that legends do is they help us in some ways enact and capsulize our fears. And we know in the current moment what has circulated most quickly and most widely has been stuff that captures fear and anger. And so it's it's hard to beat fear and anger. It's hard to be the calm person in the room trying, right? Because, and, and fear and anger have always traveled well in narrative form. And the people who, who spread fear and anger have usually been really good and, and intuitively known that narratives would would be the most effective way of doing that. So I would say, you know, if you want to fight fire with fire and if you want to find some ways to tell stories, right? So I first I would say is I think this community should hold on to the fact that they have a really good argument and, and, and pride themselves that they have a logical, straightforward argument that they have as the basis for the work and thinking they do in a way that I would say others don't have arguments. So then how can you break off pieces of that argument into stories is, is what I would suggest is you can't, the larger argument is hard. You can't tell a story around that unless you're willing to write a novel and I, or, or make a major, major movie, right? Those you have to have big works to capture big sweeping stories, which is the kind of big arguments this community is trying to make. And so you're going to have to break things off into smaller pieces. And, um, you know, it isn't unlike, doing case studies or writing scenarios or building scenarios, but finding those scenarios that you can use that can call, you have to call upon common experiences, right? In order for my mirror neuron to fire, you know, it, it the protagonist has to be doing something. I have some sense of what it is. You know, if I'm reading a science fiction story or I'm reading a fantasy story and, you know, I don't know Harry Potter, but, you know, when people tell me that Harry Potter did this and was chasing some quimus, I don't know. Um, it doesn't fire a neuron because I have no idea what that is. But if, I, yeah. am I, if, I'm, if I'm in the Potter universe, right, we talk about these things as universes, and I know a quimus or whatever it was is a little flying ball, then Harry Potter rides a broom to chase it, then I'm like, I can experience it, right? So we, I think we have to break things into things that people can recognize. That's a good and point. Then, That's a good point because – for us, mo much of it is, and I think this is in in one respect, often where we lose the the argument is because whenever we say, "Hey, listen," you know, so I myself and a few colleagues recently wrote an article where we talked about blast and we talked about overpressure and we talked about thermal radiation and we talked about and we talked about it. We we tried to be very you know sort of scientific. But we weren't more careful. And so people read that. They, I, I think you're right. They just, they're, they're, they're sort of ingesting the information, but they don't necessarily say, Oh, well, that, that makes sense to me. I can see 779 meters out and the dissipation of a blast effect. They don't, they don't have a good sense of what that means. And that's, that's, yeah. you know, on us for not crafting stories that you know, have something that people can say, oh, I get it. So whenever we say, oh, you know, when you have a full body CT scan, that's that's about the amount of radiation you'll get, you know, under these effects. They say, oh, OK, I can get that. I understand that. So we obviously exactly. need to be a are terribly important. Yeah. OK, so I'm following you now. So that's helpful. That's helpful. And I think it's important to remember that. Um, you can get at qualia, you can get at what it feels like, not only through narrative, but through good description. Mm. In fact, uh, you know, I would argue that often effective description can be as good as narrative in terms of getting people to feel where you are, what you're doing, what's going on. 
right? If I tell you that you're, you know, the classic sort of Dungeons and Dragons or kind of um, other kinds of dungeon crawler games, right? We're based on you're in a room, it's dark, you hear water dripping in the background, right? None of this is action yet, but you can begin to sort of feel being there. So the, the more you can give people a chance to feel what it's like, to imagine, but they have to be able to imagine it. So it has to be things they can recognize, right? If if you if you you know, often this is what doctors have gotten really good at, right? If you if you, I remember when my wife was pregnant, and the doctor would say, "Well, your baby's not the size of a pear, you know, it's not the size of a cantaloupe." And you're like, I, I find friends like, what is it with the food metaphors? You know, what, <laughs> my, my child is not a cantaloupe. And they're like, well, that's what most people know. They understand, you know, these things. They've encountered a cantaloupe. But I, you know, if I told you it was, you know, 10 centimeters, would you care? I was like, actually, right, because I'm a scholar and scientist. Yeah, 10 centimeters, that makes sense to me. I don't want to imagine about cantaloupe. But most people aren't like that. You have to give them stuff they can recognize. So telling them that, you know, this is what you would get from being in a CT scan or this it, it feels the same way you would feel. The pressure would be the same pressure you feel as if you were standing behind a jet engine. I mean, they may not have ever stood behind a jet engine, but they can imagine that would be a bad thing. Yeah, so that's helpful. That's, you know, like, so for l- listeners, point number one, when we write and when we're making briefings, we need to provide, you know, readers or listeners some context for what they should what they should expect. Just pure science to a group that doesn't understand it, we're not getting our message across effectively. Okay, go ahead. And I, th- I think it's really good for us as well. I mean, if you think about, if you've ever watched Richard Feynman's lectures, and I re- recommend that everybody listen, go listen to at least a snippet on YouTube. There's plenty of them up there. I, I don't know how good of a physicist he was. I'm, I'm told he's really quite good. I don't know physics enough to evaluate. But he's also was an incredible lecturer. And he did it because he could take complex physics questions and theories and ideas and place them into language that people like me could understand. Um, I won't say people like you because you're smarter than me, but (laughs) people like me could understand. And I, I think that's good because I know when I'm often writing lectures from my students or when I was preparing stuff for, you know, people in the army, having to use an alternate language that wasn't my native jargon, right? made me think about the ideas more clearly. In fact, even today, preparing for this podcast, I was like, okay, how can I put these things in, in words? Not because I'm talking down to the audience, because the audience doesn't know all these narratological terms and they don't care because they're not narratologists, right? Yes. I've got to say these things in ways that are really clear and effectively communicate. And, and even in doing that, my own thinking got clearer and better. And I was like, oh, I, I, I should write about that, right? Gave me some ideas for for further work I can do, and I think that's that's really exciting. So it's it's not that I think we have to always translate for others, because but I think we do. But I think we also can enjoy that translation and how it it can bounce back towards us and make us better thinkers, writers, researchers, engineers, and operators. Yes, I agree. So point number two, clarity and simplicity. That that's helpful. It's so worth the effort. It's so worth the effort to try and communicate because it really does, I think, open up avenues in our own thinking for doing that. So how do we, because I've noticed like the discussion, the debates on nuclear weapons are, they tend to, first of all, the two communities talk past each other. I I don't think it's, I've never seen a topic outside of, you know, religion where people hold you know, for, for something that's supposed to be so scientific and so strategy and policy, it, there's a, there's this quasi religious element to the, to the debate. And so I guess I'm sort of curious when there are so many deeply held positions that, you know, no amount of facts seem to overcome. How do you pull heartstrings and compel in a way that you know, facts or not. So I'm, I'm going to offer them. I'm going to be more, I'm going to make sure I explain and give detail and narrative so that a reader can put themselves in that position and understand it. I'm going to simplify and clarify points, but how do I then is this sort of a third point to offer 
the listeners, how do I compel, you know, in an emotional heartstrings kind of way to get people to say, you know what, I, I see that. I, I understand that. I can imagine, I can imagine, you know, if these guys are right, that would be bad to do this thing that they're not telling us to do. Yeah, well, I guess I would say is when you talk about points, you're talking about parts of an argument as opposed to events, which are moments in a narrative. So I think maybe one thing to think about is how can you transform an argument that is a tight logical structure into a series of events so that it becomes a kind of narrative. Now, right, as I said earlier, not all sequences are narrative. They have to have a sense of necessary ordering so that when I arrive at the last event, it feels not conclusory, but it, it, it somehow delivers a sense of things have arrived at a moment of equilibrium, right? In fact, narrative scholars will often talk about things being that the, the world in which these things operate is somehow in disequilibrium, and what narrative does is deliver by the end of it equilibrium. This is not unlike Joseph Campbell's notion of the monomyth of, you know, we have a character, he's in his comfortable space, he starts, something happens that puts him in an uncomfortable space, things are out of balance, and then what the, what the, the protagonist or, or our hero does, in, in Campbell's words, is struggle through to achieve balance again. Yeah. And so I think what we need to think about is we've got a series of events in which disequilibrium is either already happening or there or happens. And then we, we put a series of events that then puts things back into balance and order by the end. And that's when you have a narrative. Yes. And you have a world that either starts in disequilibrium or out of balance and achieves balance by the end of it. And then that, and how it gets achieved is human cognizable, humanly imaginable. Yeah. And then you have a narrative. Yeah, that makes sense. And so in some respects, the types of arguments I tend to make, perhaps that's whenever I offer my recommendations. How do you fix it? Uh, that's maybe sort of gets at that, at, at what you're suggesting, but there's probably even better ways to get at it. Yeah, I would think, you know, with a narrative, you wouldn't say you wouldn't begin with how do you fix it? You would simply tell the story of things out of balance and then offer the fixing as part of the sequence of events so yeah. that you achieve yeah. balance by the end of it. Then you step back and you haven't made an argument. You've told a story. Yeah, I like it. Unfortunately, you know, that's go ahead, John. I say, and, and that's that's, I think, when you've achieved the narrative. And I want to be clear with your audience. I, as a fellow scholar and scientist, thoroughly believe in arguments and information, but there are definitely moments where we want to be able to tell effective stories. Yeah. You, you, you have to do both because the human, I mean, we're left and right brain. And so we both compel and, you know, overlapping storytelling and compelling arguments together, I think, are, are probably far more persuasive. Yeah. I mean, I think being able to do both makes us better, better scholars, better people. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, unfortunately, we're out of time. It was it was great having Professor John Loudon from the University of Louisiana, who is a narratologist. That is not uh, that that is not a uh, foot doctor, or uh, <laughs> you know somebody who who handles uh, you know cancer or a narratologist is somebody who handles narrative. It's a different type of doctor. So with that, I want to thank you, John. That was helpful. And so hopefully it was. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it was great. It, and it was, you know, it's surprising. You would think uh, people would initially say narratology. Why would we study narratives? But if you want to make a compelling argument and you want to try to persuade the American people you know, that we, you know, we have to modernize the nuclear arsenal. We, you know, perhaps we need theater nuclear weapons. You've got to tell compelling stories about why these things are relevant and necessary and put them in a context that people can understand and relate to. And so that's what you helped us do today, John. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And I want to thank the listeners. Thanks for listening to another episode of Nuclecast. And we will look forward to, to seeing you on the next episode.
Well, great interview with John Loudon. We talked about narrative and storytelling and how to do it better. And he offered us the four bits of a, of a narrative. And then I took away sort of three things that I would do different. Cause you know, as I'm writing op-eds and trying to, you know, to advocate and persuade on behalf of the nuclear enterprise, I am going to try to put things in a, in a context and under, offer some description that creates an image in the minds of, of readers of my articles. And then I'm going to try to write concepts as simple as possible. And then I'm going to try to have resolution. Like how, how do we, you know, all these problems, cause we do, we usually write these articles and we, we offer a problem. We open with the problem and then, but we got to have a clear resolution. How do we solve the problem? And so that's sort of what I took away from, from John's interview. And, and I hope you thought about it as well as you think about your briefings or if you're publishing, that you can try to offer more persuasive ways to help and advance the nuclear enterprise. So thanks for listening. This has been a production of the Anwa Deterrence Center. Our executive producer is Kimberly Charrington, and this episode has been engineered and mixed by David Grunthal. Follow the show on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at Nuclecast. Listen, follow, and review the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.